So we're going to learn about friendships over these next several months, and we're excited about what we're going to do. And we want to kick off today about biblical friendships, about spiritual friendships, about the way that God has a lot to say from His instruction book in life, both the old side and the new side and the different testaments of the Bible that really impact the lives of our friends. Now, I want friends, and I need friends that need friends like me, like I need them. And, and you have friends that you need, and you need them to need you like they need you, that because God has designed that in us. We are not designed to live this life alone. Listen, y'all, every account of some person that goes off to live in the desert all by themselves or on a desert island, and they come back, they come back weird, if they come back at all, because we're not designed to live alone. You see, the first thing I want to see today, and if you're following along your notes on your in your app, there's a place where it says Sunday message notes, and you can go down there and take notes and carry them with you always. Also, uh, we've skinnied down the worship guide a little bit, but every week you're going to be able to find printed copies of the notes in these cage baskets that are on the walls on both entrances. So I challenge you if you like keeping old school notes with pen and pencil and that kind of stuff, do that. I got some old school notes right here in the middle of my Bible. But the very first thing that we're going to see today is that, first of all, friends multiply my value, and, and friends multiply your value, and Friends multiply our value when we do things together. Solomon, who's called the wisest man of all time, biblically, he literally kept this entire diary in the Bible called the book of Ecclesiastes, where literally he is kind of sharing about the lessons he's learned in his life, and not everything's been happy. There's ups and there's downs in Solomon's life, but in a beautiful moment in the middle of the book, in Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verses 9 through 12, we read these words. Two are better than one. Because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. Isn't that true? Absolutely. Whether you're at work or you're at home or you're in your community or if you're at a family reunion even, if you, don't, if you fall down, uh, there's got to be somebody there to help pick you up sometimes, right? Also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? On Thursday night, we had a Navy SEAL who was on SEAL Team 5 that sits here on the front row, but he's out of town this weekend. They typically sit here, but they came on Thursday because they won't be here on Sunday. He uh, said when they were going through training, quite often as they were going through what they call Hell Week in the Coronado Beach in California where they keep them awake, they make them exercise, they make them roll around in the sand and do all these kinds of things. And sometimes they'd be so cold as they were carrying a boat back out of the into the surf together, coming back in, they would go get a few minutes to, to get together. They, they would literally huddle together and lie down, just men drawing warmth from one another, and just so that they could survive. That The same thing holds true. How can we stay warm unless the two of us come together? Now, some of you have had this happen as well, too, in your life. How many of you have been stranded in the mountains, and it's going to be a whole lot colder than you thought it was, and you're out in the tent, and you're like, okay, everybody in the family, it's time for a group family hug all night because we're all freezing up here. But he goes on to say, though one may, but how can one keep one up? Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. It literally means that we're stronger when we are together. We're always better together. That's why we emphasize group life in the life of this church. And by the way, if you don't see a group that fits you, I dare you to find one. <laughs> uh, but we'll start a group. If you want to ride motorcycles together or do backflips down the parking lot together, that's fine with me as long as you don't sue us. It's okay. So friends, first of all, multiply our value. Secondly, friends love me consistently. Friends love me and they, they love you. They, they love us consistently. When you've got a true friend, it's somebody that's going to be there for you always. As a matter of fact, Solomon writes to us again from Proverbs 17, 17. And you're going to see this verse over and over throughout the, the time that we are together. So the words are up on the screen. We're going to put the words up on the screen as friends love me consistently. I want you to say this with me out loud. A friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for a time of adversity. Let's say that together again. A friend loves at all times. And a brother is born for a time of adversity. And obviously, by way of implication, sisters as well. So if you'd rather put sister in there, let's say it again. A friend loves at all times, and a sister is born for a time of adversity. We have people in our lives that love us consistently. 
But I want to share with you that during this series, we're really going to talk about that time of adversity. And it's great when we defend ourselves together, when we link arms with friends and we defend ourselves together. It's great when we stay warm together in the cold seas of life in which we all swim. It's great when we are working together and we fall down and somebody else to pick us up. But what happens when there is adversity and there is tensions or tension between friends because of lifestyle issues, because of lifestyle choices, and lifestyle preferences. Listen, because we have the world in our hands, and we can Google, Bing, Yahoo, whatever we want to, we can social media, send something immediately, we have begun to think that people want to understand our opinion about everything in real time. Before you hit send, though, we're going to be teaching you, whether you send it through social media or in an email or out of your mouth face-to-face with a friend, we're going to be talking about these issues in life that bring all kinds of attention. By the way, did you notice as we played the intro video for you, there's some pretty controversial subjects up there. Did you notice that? It's so controversial, by the way, that Facebook would not allow us to boost it beyond our church audience. So they're kind of nervous about what we're having to say over the next several weeks and months. And I promise you that you're going to be challenged as we move through these things and as God helps us to be better friends to people all around us. Incidentally, we live in a culture that is jacked up, twisted up in all kinds of ways. There is evil alive in this world. But I would have you know, because I've studied this book and other earlier civilizations, there is nothing going on today that wasn't any more evil than was going on in the first century A.D. after Jesus came, died, rose again, and left this earth. There's all kinds of stuff, folks, that the Bible has to say. And you say, well, that's just old school stuff for old school times. Let me tell you something. We're going to learn more. There's not enough time to go into it today about how nasty some of these cultures were. Let me give you a little bit of a preview. In some of the temple worship back in those days, they had rooms out in the parking lot so that you would have sex before you came into church. We ain't going to be doing that here. That ain't going to be controversial at all. You do that at home with your wife or your husband. Bonus material for the second service. So as part of research, part of what I try to do is I try to take my time when I'm investing in you to read things and prepare and do some of the best research online. And I've I've come across a couple of books, one that I want to allude to this morning because Tom Rath is the head of Gallup Workplace Organization Research. Um, He worked with Marcus Buckingham and others to develop the StrengthsFinder 2.0 assessment of of giftedness among people, but he also wrote this book called Vital Friends. It's all based upon research about specifically people at work, but applies at home, at church, in our personal relationships. See, See, Tom says that according to the best research that they've been able to come across, among thousands and thousands of people is that we need at least eight vital friends in our lives, at work, at home, in our communities. Now, before we dive in, let me say this. If you are living your life, whether you're here in person, you're watching online, we're thrilled that you've chosen to watch with us here today, you're not under the pressure to find one BFF who meets all of your needs forever. By the way, BFF, I'm I'm in with the lingo today. You know, that's only 15 years old, right? Best friend forever. Listen, as a matter of fact, if you're putting pressure on somebody else, your person, you are trying to make your BFF to be everything for you, you're putting improper pressure on them. As a matter of fact, you're probably going to find as we go through these categories of friends that you need people that are like this. I want to invite you to do something here, not because uh, of any kind of weird thing, but I want to invite you to close your eyes. Nobody's going to do anything weird while you have your eyes closed. But I want to invite you to picture in your mind's eye somebody that is in your network, at work, at home, in your community, at your gym, wherever, that fits the answers to these questions, first of all. Who's somebody who picks you up when you're down? Picture that friend in your mind. Who do you trust with your most burning secrets because you know that they will never tell a soul? Do you have a friend like that? Who gives you advice if you're having problems with colleagues at work or parents parenting at home or with your parents? Do you have a friend 
It gives you advice when you face problems like that. Who's the first person you call when you want to go out, have fun, have a good time? Do you have a friend like that? Who will sit down and truly listen to every single word you say without interrupting or saying a word? Can you picture that friend in your mind? Who knows to push you to do more and to achieve more? And refuses to accept less than the best from you because they know you've got more in you. Who always seems to anticipate what you're about to say even before a word has left your mouth. And they're even filling in the blanks and saying along with you what it is you're about to say while you're saying it. Do you have a friend like that? Who would stick up for you if your job were on the line? Do you have a friend like that at worst? who would step in front of others to fight for you? And then finally, who runs around telling the world how great you are and they always make you feel good about yourself? Can you picture a friend like that? Okay, open your eyes. Ask your question. Did you find any gaps there? That's okay. You need to find vital friends that are like that. If you have friends that fit in all eight categories, You indeed are a fortunate person. But we want to talk about what those categories are. See, we need friends that love us consistently, and we need eight vital types of friends. The first type of friends we need are people who are builders. Builders. Who are great motivators, always pushing me to cross the finish line. Do you have any builders in your life? I have a friend named Jim. He's a pastor of a large and prominent church. He uh, is having church this morning while we're doing it here. We Every time we meet, when we meet occasionally, I'll plan to go meet and get some mentoring from him and his organization this week. He's always saying, are you, are you doing your best? Are you doing this? Are, are you doing the things that no one else is doing to reach those people that no one else is reaching? He's that kind of person. Jim is that type of friend to me. Do you have anybody also, not only that are builders, but do you have champions in your life? The second category of friends. Champions stand up for you and what you believe in. If you're going to go into a fight, They're going to go into a fight with you. They're going to lock arms like Joey and his friends on the television show, and they're going to go into battle with other people because they are with you. Maybe you also have friends that are not only builders or champions. You need people who are the collaborators. Before I move into talking about collaborators, as you see the definition on the screen, one of those champion friends for me is Mike Howard who's one of our founding members, who was opening the door for people the very first Sunday that we began as a church back in uh, 2001. And he's been so excited about this Thursday initiative and the fact that you as a church are being willing to invest in this initiative so to reach people that no one else is reaching. Literally, Mike is one of those people who's going to say and be the first one to come to my defense as a champion. But third, we need collaborators. Collaborators are are people who have similar interests as us. Collaborators co-labor literally with us. Farrell and Roel are co-laborers. They are collaborators. Um, One of the great stories I would have you tell tell you is that when Farrell drives up into Matagalpa as a, pardon me, a white dude from the south saying, y'all, he needs somebody to connect to that culture. And all of a sudden, Roel rides up and says, hey, man, what's up? (laughs) Who speaks fluent? English. He's like, you're up, baby. What's happening? And so they built this collaboration. Not only that, um, when I went to Nicaragua earlier this year, many of you know that we've had a longstanding relationship with the country of Guatemala in a couple of locations. And our country leader from Guatemala drove down to Managua, which is set to our south of Matagalpa, where these guys are from, to help 10 other churches to network together to grow in the Managua area. So I was able to take Raul and Farrell down to Managua to meet the mission team from the other mission that we serve in Guatemala because the Guatemalan dude had driven six to eight hours to get there to meet them. And not only that, when we got there, we, were, we saw the pastor that was in the local community leader. He took us up on the roof, and he said, well, you need to do some things to straighten out our roof. And Raul's an engineer. He says, I'm an engineer. I will help you with your roof. <laughs> not only that. But they said, you know what, We're, we spend a lot of time going to mission trips far away. Why don't we come from Nicaragua to go to Guatemala to do a mission trip with our kids? Y'all are all part of that. 
That's what co-laboring is all about. Another example of a collaborator, certainly Raul and, and Farrell are, are friends of mine, and Mary and Abby Sophia. But I also have a co-laborer that's a friend of mine from graduate school. You were able to hear him this summer. His name is Jeff Neal, and Jeff used to play for the Houston NFL team. He was the strongest man in the NFL at that time. And he's not only got a strong body, he's got a strong mind. And whenever we want to sharpen one another, we want to challenge one another about how we're thinking and the, the things we're challenged with in school, he is a collaborator with me as well. Fourth, we need companions. Companions are people who are always with me no matter what the circumstances. Always with me in the good, in the bad, in the ugly, in the beautiful. And Andrea Hardy has been that person for me. In her vows to me on our wedding day, on June 23rd, 1984, that's 35 years for those of you that are counting, she said, in good times and in bad, with guidance from God, I am your partner, I am your wife. And that's been true. Now, she is the first person to tell me when things are bad and I'm acting bad that I'm acting bad. But she's also there for me when everybody else runs away. And I'm grateful for her love and companionship in this life. We also need people that are not just builders, champions, collaborators, companions. But we also need people in our lives who are connectors, who are bridge builders, who help me get what I want. Do you have any bridge builders in your life? Do you have people in your life where you know you go to them and you say, I've got a problem with this or that, or that issue in my life. And they say, yeah, I know a guy. <laughs> or yeah, I know a lady. They can help you out. I can hook you up. Dwayne Burks is that kind of person with us. Dwayne Burks is a friend of mine that I've known for literally 30, 25 to 30 years. Dwayne is the head of the Greater Gaston County YMCA Gateway. That YMCA Gateway is a clearinghouse to help people with all kinds of needs that they would have in their life, from addiction to I can't pay my rent or I can't pay my electric bill, I need a job, whatever. He is organized, and we contribute financially to the Gaston Gateway and through intellectual help as well, the little bit that I've got. But we help Dwayne because Dwayne is the guy who knows everything from the every, everything and everyone from the president to the pope. I mean, he can tell you something about everything. And literally, we're part of this organization. You'll see these stickers sometimes as you come into our church building, members of the Gaston YMCA Gateway. Somebody comes and says, I have a need. We have them to fill out a form online. It goes to them via email. Within 90 minutes, they get a call with a plan of how they can take their next step, and Dwayne leads that initiative. Aren't you glad we've got Dwayne's like that in the world? Six, we need people that are energizers in our life, people, people who lift us up, people who just make us feel good about ourselves. Ronnie Hallman, who's a, a friend of mine, long-standing friend of mine, is that kind of guy. I just love hanging out with Ronnie. He energizes. He lifts me up. My brother Roger's that way. My brother Roger's sitting here on the front row with the blue shirt on the big smile because he invited some friends to church. He's, a, he's filled up two rows, by the way, y'all, so you need to kind of follow suit like him, bring your friends like he has. And, uh, and, and Roger, literally, everything I do, he makes it better. If, if I've made $100, he said I made $150. If, he said, if I've run a six-minute mile, he says I've run a four-minute mile. I mean, it always gets better when, when Roger, because he's that kind of energizer in my life. And in our community, one of the friends that I have that's an energizer for me is a man named Jesse Caldwell. Jesse Caldwell is a district court judge who lives in a very tough place doing a tough thing, but he always has a 1,000-watt smile on his face. The other day, I drove up to the courthouse to deliver a Bible study book for a Bible study that begins tomorrow morning among community leaders that I'm a part of. And the dude comes out with a pink seersucker suit on and a pink tie and a thousand-watt smile and blue eyes shining. He's just that kind of guy. Jesse is an energizer. Ronnie and Roger are energizers. And then we have people in our lives that are, that are mind openers, people that literally help us to expand our horizons and encourage us to embrace new ideas and opportunities and cultures and people. Literally, I want to be that person for you in the days and weeks to come. But I have another friend in my life. His name is Ray. And as a matter of fact, in my small group that meets in the mornings, uh, he's in that group. And, and we actually have this little diary of what we call Rayisms. We keep a record of them. And here's one of them. Ray says, there's not a lot of traffic on the high road of life. When you take the high road, there's not a lot of traffic. That's kind of stuff he just says. He also said to me one time as I was considering a decision about merging and, and maybe combining with another prominent church, he said, remember this, there are no mergers, there are only acquisitions. 
And usually the big acquires the small. It don't, he's a mind opener. It's like, drop the mic, let's finish, because that was worth coming today. We need people in our lives to expand our horizons. And then finally, we need people who are navigators. People who give me advice and keep me headed in the right direction. People who give me advice, keep me headed in the right direction. Pastor Doug is that person, one of those persons in my life. Now, if I've left you out, certainly all of our staff members at our church are friends, and I could point out various things about them. There's not enough time. Many of you out there are friends, and you're going like, you didn't mention my name. Well, don't be offended because I wish we had more time, but we don't. But you'll notice that in this list of friends that for me, that most of my closest friends are men. They, they literally are men. And uh, I have other friends that are females. My, my mom is a friend. Uh, she's the most dedicated person I know, the most committed person I know. My mother-in-law, my mother-in-love is what I call her. She's the most street smart woman I've ever known. I have other friends and colleagues that are women that I do. As a matter of fact, we begin this Thursday service by listening to the women in our congregation who are nurses who work on the weekends that say, I can't do this, or doctors, or they have a, they're traveling or whatever. We, but the point is, and Ronnie Hallman would tell you, I don't know if Ronnie's here today, I think they're actually out of town. Ronnie had two bad marriages before he had a good one. Ronnie's been married to love his life, Becky, for over 40 years, maybe even 50, I can't remember. But he says this, he said that sitting in this seat right on this stage before, that you don't need best friends that are of the opposite gender, particularly if you're married. Now, if you're working on one another, I guess, to get engaged, maybe that's one thing. But that's just a little wisdom, and, and that's not gospel. It's just something that you might take and use to apply to your life. Next, my friends make me better. As we taxi in for a land to hear, my friends make me better. Listen to this verse. As iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. As iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. And at uh, in a Harvard University classroom last year, where I'm going to take some classes in graduate school, my Divinity School professor said, I will never forget that verse because it is so appropriate to what we are discussing. You see, but when iron sharpens iron, sparks fly sometimes. You disagree over some things. But it doesn't mean that the friendship has to be in jeopardy because you disagree about some things. This whole series is going to be talking about tackling about the ethical issues of our day. And then finally, I need friends who love me too much to let me be. I have friends who love me too much to let me be. A true friend will grab you by the ears and say, don't do that. True friends will grab you by the ears and say, do do that. A true friend is somebody that's willing to tell you the truth even when it hurts. Listen to these words. Again from Solomon, Proverbs 27, 17. Better is open rebuke than hidden love. Wounds from a friend can be trusted but an enemy multiplies kisses. That means a friend's willing to say the tough thing while the enemy walk up to you, and they will smile at you and shake your hand and say, I love your brother, and at the same time, they will stick it to you in the back. Pick your friends carefully. But I would also say to pick your friends well, but don't pick them to pieces because they're not doing everything you want them to do when you want them to do them. Listen, we need to remember the words of that great theologian, Lou Rawls, who I think is now in heaven now. That people are people, and they all have their moods. But it's so nice to have a friend like you, the word, and the song continues. So what? We ask two questions here. If you're new with us today, uh, we always ask two questions at the end of every message. So what, and now what? So the so what question today is very simply this. So how can I be the friend that God has designed for me to be? And how do we handle the tough issues between us when we disagree? How can I be? How can you be? How can we be the kind of friends that God has designed us to be? And how can we handle the tough issues that come between us? How? I'll suggest to you in these few last minutes that we have together a filter that we're going to use for everything we discuss during this series. It's a, it's a filter for not only what you say, because here it says four questions to ask uh, in my friendship communications. It also has to do with your actions. Whether you post something, email something, say something live, you open up the front door of your being and you tell somebody something out of you, 
before you interact with them in such a way, think about what it is you're going to say. And each one of these questions should be answered in the affirmative. More about these later, but let me just say quickly what they are. First of all, is what I'm about to say, is it true? Is it true? Now, if you love to be abrasive and true, you need to ask yourself the same question, the second question, is it kind? Is it kind? You know, scripturally it says that it is the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. He doesn't beat us over the head. Instead, it's the kindness of God. So if you're going to be a friend and you want to sharpen a friend, you need to be truthful, but you also need to be kind. Third, is it helpful? Is it helpful? Let me just go and help you all, some of you all with your social media accounts, because I've seen some of you out there. Some of the things you say ain't helpful. You're giving people an opinion nobody wants to hear. You're giving them a piece of your mind you can't afford to lose. I know that because I've given a piece of my mind I can't afford to lose, and he can't take it back. No, 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 I'm sorry. I'm just saying, is it true? Is it kind? Is, is it helpful? If it's not helpful, don't say it. Don't do it. And then finally, is it clear? Is it clear? What people will do sometimes is they will take what you say, oh, yes, you mean this. No, I meant that. That much. So we're going to be learning about that. But the bottom line today simply is now what? And I always put things in your worship guides, in your notes, in your app. I will commit myself to be with and build up, my friends, even if and especially when we differ. That's where we're going. But I want to give you an opportunity now to make a decision. Do you know God calls you a friend? He said Abraham was a friend of God. And listen, Abraham had lots of issues, y'all. If God likes friends like Abraham, he likes you too. Do you know that God, while he is Lord and Master, he calls you his friend? But first of all, in order to experience all that God has for you, he has to be Lord and he has to be Master. You say no to everything else, I'm following him. So I want to invite Christ followers and the people who are becoming Christ followers today to bow your heads and hearts around the room. We'll pray together. Today, if, if you have heard God's voice and you know it, you've tried everything else, and things are still not working, and you know your life is not in line with the friend that God is, first he needs to be Lord and Master in your life. And today I challenge you to surrender. And I'm just going to pray a very simple prayer so that you can cross the line of faith like two people did in our first service. If today this is the, the prayer of your heart, I challenge you. You can pray it out loud as some people did in our first service. You can pray it silently by moving your lips or you can pray it within your heart and your mind and it will echo to heaven. But today, if you want to receive all that Christ did for you to make, you, make him Lord and Master, to be your friend and your brother as well, would you pray this prayer with me? Dear God, thank you for sending Jesus. Please forgive me of my sins. Help me to know you more. Help me to follow you more. As my Lord and my Master, I am choosing today to give you my life. I'm not perfect, but I am yours. In Jesus' name. And before you lift your heads, I just want to invite those people in the room, if if that's been the prayer of your heart, to take a first step of indicating that <coughs> today. I want to personally <coughs> welcome you like I did the two folks in the first service. And I'm just going to count to three. And if that's been the prayer of your heart today, in your mouth, and your mind, you, you've made this decision to follow Christ. I'm going to just count to three and ask you to shoot your hand up and lift your head up at the same time. You ready? Don't hesitate. One, two, three. Would you lift your hand and lift your head? I see your hand. God bless you, young man. I see you right there. There are others. I see some hands over there in the back. God bless you. Is there someone else? I see your hands over here. God bless you. Welcome to the kingdom of God. It's my sister and my brother. Thank you for coming here today. Are there others? I'm missing somebody. If I am, I'm sorry. I just can't see you. Father, thank you for these three also who have said yes to you for the first time. And I ask your blessings on them and through us as a church. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, let's welcome. 
these folks in the kingdom of God. So for those of you that, that raise your hand, I want to challenge you to do um, one of two or three things. Um, first, after the service, I'd love to if you would just come up here and say, hey, I nailed it today. I want to just let you know and that kind of stuff. And others of you, you're kind of we're you know, more private, but we I still want people to come alongside to help me. And it's really important if you said that and you've meant it, not to try to go out there and live life alone. And so we challenge you to take this little card on your worship guide. There's a place where it says, I've decided to accept accepted Jesus for the first time today. There's also a place on your app under next steps where you can go and say, I've taken this next step. And we're just going to follow up with you. We are not going to helicopter mom you or helicopter church you. But we want to come alongside to help you to take your next steps in your journey with Christ. Remember also the step of baptism. You can see the folks standing under the blue baptism sign out there, whether you want to get married, uh, bar- baptized, not married, baptized in the river or here. Um, but the final thing we want to do today is to do something that Jesus told us to do before he left this earth. Uh, Christmas is approaching, and we're going to remember Jesus in a big way at Christmas. We give gifts to one another and say we give them to Jesus, but I guess he's okay with that. But he said on the night before he was betrayed um, to remember him in this way. By the way, you should have been given a communion kit that looks like this, this little plastic thing with a wafer on top. If you did not get one, would you please raise your hand so our team can give you one? If there's somebody here today that did not, they're walking around the room. I see you up here. <clears throat> Lee's going to bring one to Graham and Richard up here. There's a lady over here as well. Reba needs one. There's a couple over in the corner back over here as well too. Um, Rick, would you come up here and get there, uh, Richard and um, and Lee, Rick, and uh, Graham, G-Man. The G-Man is here. There you go. Thank you so much. So if you peel the little plastic top off, you see the wafer becomes available. This wafer is a remembrance of Jesus on the night before he was betrayed. He said, this is my body, which is given for you. Eat you all of it. Jesus, thank you for giving your body last